got one just going to graduate here in, a, in another month from Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, he was in my classes for seven years, but he was so excited. But he got back there and he said, this is easy. He said, if I hadn't been in your classes, this would have been a real load. But he said it was easy. He knew more about Greek than his teachers did. So uh, anyway, he was spouting off the rules of grammar and everything else. And he said, what? They didn't want to say it. They didn't understand what he was talking about. But anyway, uh, <coughs> do you have any questions? Brother Rex, got something going? No? Oh, one thing. You yeah. were talking about that dual prophecy the other night. I didn't understand that. All right. It's a double prophecy, a dual prophecy. Ezekiel uh, uh, 28, Isaiah 14, there's both dual prophecies. Isaiah um, 7, 14 is a dual prophecy. Something happened right then in the, in the near time, and it was also a prophecy of something that would happen in the future. Uh, all prophecy is, is what we say something before it happens, yeah. uh, but sometimes it tells a story in the past. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 told, told the story of what happened way back in the eternity past with, with Satan when he rebelled against God, or Lucifer, I should say. I don't like to call him Satan except after he became Satan. He was Lucifer, he was created perfect, and he rebelled against God. And it told about uh, what he did, but what's going to happen to him also. And uh, Isaiah... And Ezekiel, one of them talked about the, the king of Babylon, and the other one talked about the king of Tyre and what was going to happen. The whole prophecy of the king of Tyre, uh, Alexander the Great was going to come, and he was going to go against the city of Tyre. The city of Tyre uh, had kind of a false front city on the shores, inland. They had a city. But after Alexander the Great come up there, and he went up to the walls, he got over there, and... Uh, and conquered them, ready to go in and kill them. And what he would do, he would go in and conquer a people, and they could give up. And he would allow them to be a state of his great nation. Okay? And they would be a city-state, and they would have rights. They could keep a lot of their own culture and everything else. A lot of the kings and everything he would allow to live if they would be subservient to him. Well, he jumped the walls over there, of well, these war machines and everything else, and they were out there on an on a island off the shore, laughing at him. They were out there, and they had more walls out there. And they knew that he couldn't take his war machines, which were great big uh, catapults and everything else, and, and the wall, you know, they beat the walls down, and th that he knew that they couldn't do that. They could not go out there. The, the prophecy of that was that he would scrape the great, the dirt on the ground would be scraped up and filled in the inlet. And they would scrape all of this down, and he said, you're going to be nothing but a place for spreading the nets. The great city that was out there with the wall city, he scraped off, he tore down all the old city, threw it in the ocean, and built a ramp to go out there, and he did it. And they made him mad, and he completely destroyed that place and this leveled it. So it was a prophecy of what would happen in the past, and a prophecy of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, he... Uh, Named people, and of course, some of your modern school of criticism, they say that they don't believe that the book of Daniel was written by one man, but about five or six different Daniels, because it covers too many, too many years of prophecy. When they prophesied that Cyrus the Great would come up, and of course, then when they read the prophecy of him, you know, this was a long time before he ever was ever born, and it named his servant Cyrus. When he did, when they read that to him, he said, "Wow." I'm important to God. And she said, do whatever you need to do. Do whatever the prophecy said. Have at it. No. Well, some people don't want to believe that the book of Daniel is, is uh, inspired of God. Prophecy. Some people that even call, some people, some churches in Christian dumb. You're going to find, as the prophecy of the parables said, it, the prophetic parables of Matthew 13. And we're going to read Matthew 13 tonight. That's where we want to go. Because I know that when I read it this time, you're going to understand it a whole lot better than you did eight weeks ago. It's going to, make a, whole, it's going to be a whole different book. Uh, there was going to be a controversy in Christendom. There was going to be people that name the name of Christ but do not believe that he is God. 
there's going to be people that name uh, Christianity but don't believe it. Uh, and there's going to be every shade of them from almost right to way out there. All right? And, and it's it, that's what's going to happen. Now, does that un do you understand dual prophecy a little bit better now? Okay. Because I don't want you leaving you hanging. Now, there's a time element to learn it. I don't care. And I know, brother, you, you've got some... You've got some Bible under your belt. I know that. And it's sometimes it's a challenge to get a teacher that can feed you like that. Uh, but there's a time element to learn. Some things, like, some things that I have given to you are brand new, I believe. And it takes a while to understand that. Uh, I've had people in my class that would be in my classes for three years and all of a sudden you see the light turn on. Bling. Wow, I understand. I've been trying to understand this three years. All of a sudden, it dawns on me. People come to the classes. And uh, I had one person here a while back. Uh, he'd been in my classes for seven years. And just here a while back, he understands what the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is. All this time, he hasn't realized that, but all of a sudden, the light was turned on. He realized that the Lord left an assembly here in this world that was going to represent him until he came back. And he said, wow, I didn't realize that. I missed it. I always thought about people being saved and they were just saved people, you know. He said, I didn't realize there was a there was a group of people all through the ages somewhere that believed in the Lord and carried on the torch all down through the ages. That's really important. Today, so many people that and Baptists have taught that forever. But today, they're not. So many aren't. They'll just either lay it down or don't even teach it at all. We're in a period of time right now where it's probably the most dangerous period theologically in the world. I told you when this country was founded, Baptists took their swords this is one of the only wars they ever fought. <coughs> and some of them still didn't fight because some of them just were pacifists. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. They did that for hundreds of years, thousands of years. But they fought during the Revolutionary War. And they baptized, they bled themselves into a great pot and baptized, baptized their swords in it and said, we will not sheath our swords until we have won religious freedom in this world in one place where we can go and preach God's word. And they did. But then opened the doors here for all types. Religious freedom really means religious freedom, people. That means you can believe anything you want to. All right? And Baptists have always stood for that. We've never, I mean, we preach the Bible. We preach God's Word. We preach the history of God's churches. We preach all those things. And where the moth flops, it flops. Okay? It's going to offend people, but... It'll defend Protestants that aren't really part of the God's churches or whatever else. And, and it's going to bother some of them. But we're going to preach it. We're not going to go beat them over the head and hold a knife through their throat and make them uh, be saved and make them believe one thing. They're not going to pay state church taxes to, to build our church houses. God's churches meant to be supported by the assembly that is in that little gathering right there. And that's why the way God's churches are supposed to be supported, not by programs and things. And that's it. I taught on tithing this morning. Tithing goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when, when uh, Abel and Cain were having their conflict there. Uh, uh, Cain told a or Abel told Cain, he said, if you divide correctly, you're not going to have a problem. He not only brought a cursed offering from a cursed ground, but he brought the wrong amount. He's too tight and stingy. He wouldn't he wouldn't pay. But every false religion, by the way, will ask more of you than the true churches. Do you know that? And you get nothing. <laughs> In return, or not very much. Anyway, well let's go on and go on to Matthew. Got any other questions? Matthew the 13th chapter. We're going to look at this now. Matthew chapter 13. Kalamathion. The Gospel according to Matthew. The prophetic parables, and and I hope you're reading the book.
Why, this is a test night, by the way. Why did Jesus teach in parables? Mm -hmm. To hide the truth. To hide it. Now, the rabbis taught in parables to explain the truth. Jesus went absolutely, parables weren't something brand new. But the Bible had prophesied that he would preach in parables to hide the truth because they were not worthy of the truth. All right? Well, those people that were the administrator of, of the kingdom, of God's kingdom on earth at that time, God is going to use them again in the millennial reign. And they will be the administrator, but God is going to get them ready. He set them aside right now. Israel is set aside. And the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he called them out, in Galilee, he said, I'll be with you until the end of this age. And after this age, there's a tribulation period that prepares Israel to be the administrators of God's kingdom on earth for 1,000 years. And one-sixth of the Gentile population will go into that period of time in their real bodies. They're not died and went to heaven or anything like that. They're going to be in human bodies. And then the, the remnant of Israel. And Israel will be the representative of God's kingdom there. But when he came here, when he went into the temple area and he cleansed the temple, he took away the reins of the kingdom from Israel. He told them, you are bankrupt. You are finished. And he, the king, went on the throne. And when Pilate asked him if he was the king of the Jews, what did he tell him? You spoke right here. Yeah, that's right. I am the king of the Jews. He was supposed to be. Herod was not supposed to be on the throne. Herod, his father, killed all of those children, the boys, in Bethlehem years before. Thirty-something years before. To get rid of the real king, because he knew he was an imposter. Alright? Now let's read as we go to Matthew 13. On that Jesus, on that day, I can't read with or without my glasses. Isn't that something? <laughs> sure can't read with them. <clears throat> On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the Sea of Galilee. Okay, I'm not throwing Galilee in there. And great multitudes. By the way, this great multitudes, this word is Okloy. All right? Okloy means 15,000 people or more. An Oklos is 5,000. Okloy, that's plural, that means it's at least three times that many. It would be do well. This is plural, so it's going to be at least 15,000 people now. Now, that's a pretty good sized group. About 10,000 people come to Valley Baptist Church, and this is the big church right here. This is a big assembly of people right here. This was bigger. Much bigger. We'll have three, four, five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand people in church in Sunday school some Sunday morning. This is fifteen thousand plus people. That was a lot of people to feed too, wasn't it? Remember when he fed them? Great multitudes gathered about him so that he got into a boat. How many of you have ever been fishing out in the boat on the lake? All right. The sound carry on water. Real good. This cat carries underwater even better. Do you know that? But it carries on water. You can talk to somebody over there across the lake just in a normal voice because it carries right over there. It just reflects the sound just right over there. So what did he do? He used his creation. He knew that he'd speak. Great multitudes about him. So they got into a boat and sat down and the whole multitude uh, kept on being standing on the beach or on the shore. And he spoke many things to them and Parables. Parables. What does parable mean? Mm -hmm. It means to throw beside. To throw something spiritual beside something physical. Okay? And parables saying, Behold the sower went out to sow. The sower. And he sowed some seeds beside the road, and the birds came and devoured them. Now who are the birds? Who are the birds? Uh, the unbelievers? Mm -hmm. The uh, False teachers or con? Well, I, I would say the unbelievers, the uh, uh, basically false teachers, you know. Mm -hmm. The devils. Mm -hmm. False religion. Yes, yes. Yeah, false exactly. religion. That's what it is, false religion. False religion, the Bible is God's word. But false religion will twist it up and wrangle it in a million pieces. How many of you ever gone out and had a, have you ever seen an old barrel or barbed wire? <laughs> or or Balaam bar. You couldn't hardly pick one piece of that out if you wanted to. 
It's all tangled up. That's the way the religious world wrangles the Word of God. Now the devil, he couldn't stop God's churches. But he could chew and multiply them to where people can't even tell where to go. And the birds came and they devoured them up. And some fell upon rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately, useless is what it says, immediately they sprang up because there was no depth of soil. Some people get all excited when they, they've never seen the Bible, and I don't care what it is, they get all excited at first when they read the Bible and they get excited about it. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. They're excited fleshly. This is emotional religion. True religion is a, it is a uh, combination of intelligence, intellectual, physical, and emotional. It is a combination of those things, triunely. Okay? Triunely. Let's go to, uh, right there, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23 and then Colossians 1 and 27. 1 Thessalonians 5 23. Now God made us in His image. We're triune. We're spirit. We're body and we're soul. Triunely. Now God, it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Not only is He going to redeem mankind, but He's going to redeem the physical, material universe back to Himself. Now right now, you're dying, people. I'm dying. I'm going downhill, you know. I mean... When you come out, when you pop out in this world, you start dying, and that's just it. But God does make provision for the material creation, and that even means your material body is going to be resurrected. Anastasia. Okay? Anastasia. What does Anastasia mean? Ana and Stasia. Two Greek words. The Greek princess Anastasia. Remember her? Her name meant the resurrection, to stand again. Your body will stand again, either glorified or non-glorified. It's going to stand again. You're going to be resurrected. First Thessalonians 5 and verse uh, 23. Uh, have you got that, Connie? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, he's talking about the triuneness of you. Now, your spirit and your body, that's two things, and soul, all right? Your spirit is what gives you life. And I told you before when I drew that little uh, uh, diagram up on this uh, blackboard up here, your triune, all right? You're made, you're made in the very image of God. Your body, your spirit, and you are suke, soul. All right? Soul. Now, one day, you're going to stand before God triunely. Just like He created you. If you, in the end of time, all of those that do not believe, do not trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, at the great white throne judgment, all lost people are going to be Anastasia, resurrected but they're going to be resurrected in unglorified bodies. Still with all that pain and everything in them and susceptible to it. If you are born again, if you know the Lord, if you're born from above, remember, born again, ana genesin. That means born again. When you're born the first time, every time in the Bible where it talks about the firstborn, the firstborn is rejected in the Bible. When we're born the first time, we're born with a curse. When we're born again, the curse is lifted. Not only that curse is lifted, but this spirit that of rebellion that was in us is removed. It's kicked out. And the Spirit of God comes in us and marks us, brands us, and identifies our DNA to be resurrected in a glorified manner. Just like Jesus, after he was resurrected, he was his bodily resurrected. His, he was glorified in the resurrection. He still had hands, feet, everything, just like we see.
but it was glorified no longer to be susceptible to any pain or frailty or degeneration, period. All right? So, blameless. And uh, all of us, triunely. Now go to Colossians uh, 127. Colossians 127. <coughs> Colossians is a beautiful book. It talks about the deity of Christ. It talks about him being the creator. Uh, triunely, the Father thought the plan. The Holy Spirit enforced the plan. And God the Son brought it into existence. All right? And there aren't three gods. There is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. All right? The only God you're ever going to see is Jesus. That's it. Period. There's no other God. Not going to visibly see anything. We can worship God in spirit today, don't we? Do we not? We're supposed to worship Him in the spirit of truth. Because we can't see Jesus today. But He's been here. And when you see Him, you're going to see the nail-scarred hands. You're going to see the person on the throne of God. That's it. That's who you're going to see. There's no other God besides that God. Allah, they say the uh, Islam, say that they worship Allah. And they don't believe in any other gods whatsoever. Only Allah. There's only one God. Well, there's only one God, all right. But he, we were made in His image. All right, Colossians 127. Who's got that? I need to ask a question. Okay, yeah. Uh, me and Rex are having a Bible study with my niece, uh -huh. and uh, she has, uh, she's not a Christian. Uh -huh. And she says, uh, why then did, if Jesus was God, why did he ask for the cup to, uh, why did he ask for him to help him uh, the night before he was uh, killed? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Got my That's a good question. There. That's a real good question. Was Jesus really flesh? Uh, yes. Did he really have flesh? Yeah. That's, you know, the Gnosticism, uh, especially the Serentian Gnostics, didn't believe that Jesus was ever resurrected. So John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John to combat what they believed at that period of time. That's why those books are in the Bible. Uh, they thought he was a spirit. He was raised a spirit. Okay? And... Uh, John, by the inspiration of God, I mean the Bible is inspired by the inspiration of God, John wrote the Gospel according to John. There were three Gospels. And he thought that was enough. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. But Tertu, uh, uh, Paul, Polycarp, which was John's disciple, said that he told him, he said, John, why did you write the fourth Gospel and it was so late? He said, because I wasn't going to write a gospel until God put it on my heart to write the gospel. He said, because people did not believe in the deity of Christ that God had become flesh. That Jehovah, that Jehovah had become flesh and stood among mankind. When he did that, his body was subject to pain and hunger and thirst. Didn't he? Hmm? Mm -hmm. he, if he was really human, then he, he got problems out in the Christian dumb and, and the cults and whatever. They take the God of heaven. Now, for God so loved the world, okay, that he gave his only begotten Son, the only begotten God. All right? Jesus was God, but he was begotten in flesh. Now, when, you, when God begat himself in flesh, he was, goes all the way back to Genesis. He was a seed of the woman, without sin. But was he subject to hunger? If he didn't eat, did he get hungry? If he didn't get thirst, did he get thirsty? You better believe he did. Did he need to sleep? What was he doing out there on the Sea of Galilee on the, in that boat out there? He wore himself out. His body suffered. When he... Just look at it this way also. When Lazarus died, what does it say he did? He wept. Did he suffer? Yes, he did. Here we have the second Adam. The first Adam, he was in a perfect paradise with no problems, plenty of food, 
God had made the garden, everything else, all he had to do was obey. He didn't. The second Adam, the God of heaven that comes down to earth, he comes down in the devil's playground. Or when Jesus started his ministry, where did he go? Immediately. Immediately what happened? He went to the wilderness. And what did he do there? Have a feast? He communed with the wild animals? And he did not eat or drink anything for 40 days and just think about that. Adam, the first Adam, was in the garden with everything he needed. The second Adam, when he, the testing comes on, God said, I can do this. He went out there for 40 days. And then it says, after he was hungry. And what happened when he was hungry? All right, the devil tried to tempt God. Pay attention to this now. The devil tried to tempt the Lord of heaven. So he comes out there, and he said, if you are the Son of God, do you think he thought, didn't think he was the Son of God? He said, if you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread and eat. And what did Jesus tell him? You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God. And who was speaking to him? God. My word. Okay? That's what was supplying Jesus. Okay? I'm going to tell you something. That body was suffering because it was real. It was tangible. It, that which may be touched is tangible. Next uh, great thing, he took him up on a, uh, a high mountain. Mountain is in the Bible uh, typifies what? Government. And he took him up there in the thrones and, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and he says, I'll give them all to you if you'll bow down and worship me. And what did he say? I can't remember. <laughs> worship the Lord your God. You shall worship the Lord thy God and Him only. And they said, Here I am. You worship me. Here I am the Lord your God. You worship me. I'm not going to worship you. And then he uh, took him up there on the pinnacle of the temple, you know, the corner of the temple wall, and he said, Jump down off of there. It says that the angels will bury you. All right? And then he said what to him? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What was he saying? The Lord thy God was talking to Satan. He said, Thou shalt not tip the Lord thy God. And that was the end of the story. Thou, not, thou shalt not tip. Every time he said, I am God. And he, he turned the word of God on him. The devil was quoting scripture. False religion quotes scripture. Alright. When he was in the garden, he was suffering for our sins and he in eternity past, the Lamb, Jesus stood as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. But in space and time, now, the promise was all here. Every one of these, from, from Adam all the way down through here to Moses and all the children of Israel, right here to the cross of Calvary, it was a promise. It was not a reality. Now, you might say God is not uh, hindered by space and time. No, He isn't. But I'm going to tell you something. Until God became flesh to buy your salvation, it wasn't done. They looked forward to a promise that God would come. Now God is going to redeem His people, not someone else. God said, I'm going to do it. I am the Redeemer. He said, there is only one God and no other God besides me. He said, there is not one after me and there won't be one before me. I am the only God. And he became flesh, but in space and time, now, in space and time, he is going to suffer. Because a pet debt had to be paid. Okay? The debt had to be paid. So, where is he suffering? He saw Israel betray him. He saw his, he saw his uh, people come and walk with him no more uh, when he had, had hard sayings all this had happened he had maybe a half a million people that had well more than that millions of people had heard him preach we just had over 15,000 people in this one place okay and not very many followed him they heard God the son preach they watched Moses wanted to see the form of God. 
And he said he saw his backside in all his glory. But here is, John 1, 14 says, Kaholokosarks again until, and the Jehovah flesh he became and pitched his tent, just like he wanted to back there in the tabernacle. That's what all that stood for among mankind. But now, God is going to pay the price. He's going to pay the price. And he's paying the price. God of heaven is paying for your sins right there. All of my sins were on Jesus right there in that garden. The wine press. Okay? And he was praying. The human part of Jesus was praying. God had become flesh. Now here is the tangible part. That tangible flesh was suffering for us. Okay? God decided this. We didn't do it. God decided in eternity past, but in space and time it happened. And right there he was suffering. Do you think it didn't hurt those when they drove those nails through his carpal tunnel? <laughs> huh? That's her. Yeah, I've got two of them here. I know. You don't think... Yes, young lady. Okay. Uh, why on the cross did he... And I can't quote it because I don't know. Eloi, Eloi, Amasabachthani? Something about my God or... Yeah. How come you have forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Psalm 22 and verse 1. Psalm 22 is a whole story. Isaiah 53 is a whole story. He became sin for us. He was treated like he was dirt on that cross. For us, because of us. And the person, the person, the body of Jesus suffered for our sins on that cross. And that body cried out and said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he? He was sin and he couldn't look at one sin. Your debt had to be paid. That's hard stuff. But God did it. Now, when you read, when we read these parables, you're going to see more than you ever did before. I hope. All right? In the person on the cross of Calvary, and then he said, finally, what was the last thing he says? It is finished. It's been paid. And he gave up. He released his spirit. I'm going to tell you something. There's only, only being that ever gave his life. He didn't, they didn't take it from him. They beat the tar out of him. He should have died. But he did not release his spirit until he released it. He said, you tear down this temple in three days, what's he going to do? I will raise it up. But the Bible is really funny because it says the Father would raise him up and the eternal spirit would raise him up and Jesus said he'd raise himself up. Who raised him up? The triune God. The triune God felt our sins on the cross of Calvary. That's God, the one that loves you now. That's not some figure in the imagination. That's not some prophet that God sent to die for you. That's God becoming flesh and God tasting death for us. Brother David. Okay. And he spoke many things in them parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out sold, some sold beside the road, and other in rocky places. And then uh, it sprang up immediately because they had no depth of soil. And verse 6, And when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. When you don't have any root in Christ, I don't care how much religion you got, it's not, you're not going to stand before God. You've got to be rooted in Him. You've got to be rooted in the truth. And others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on good soil. Now this parable should be the parable of four kinds of soil, not the parable of the sower, because it's talking about four types of individuals. And he yielded a crop of some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And in the book of Revelation it says, He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. All right? Verse number 10, And disciples came to him uh, and said, uh, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Now how did he speak to his disciples, his church? How did he speak to his habitual learners, his little ecclesia that he called out? How did he speak to them? Straight talk, wasn't it? To you it has been granted to know the mysterion, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has... To him more shall be given. Now, if you're in the truth, you're going to learn a little more all the time. But if you're not in the truth, you're not going to have nothing. That's it. You'll, you'll see the book, but you're not going to understand the book. 
You'll never understand the book from Genesis through Revelation. You'll never un- be able to untie that tabernacle. You'll never be able to untie all the types. The law of Moses. You know that we're all under the law until we are saved? We're under the curse of the law until we're saved. Did you know that? We are under the curse of the law until we are born again. When you're born again, you're no longer responsible for that law because Jesus Christ kept that law. He kept it for you. Him shall be more given, and he that shall have abundance, and whosoever does not have even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they don't see. While hearing, they don't hear. Nor do they understand. Can they put it together? And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. You keep on hearing, but you do not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. They have closed their eyes. Do you see that? I believe everybody has heard the truth at least one time in life. You know, I get hate mail all the time. Did you know that? From, from religious cults and isms. I get it all the time. My, the, the only thing I get, I don't get much offerings at all, but I get plenty of hate mail telling me how they're going to convert me and, and that God and this is God and I don't know God and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know what? They're blind. They're blind. I put that website out there for one reason, so people be saved and so people get founded in the truth. This is our production room right here. It goes all over the world. And I've recorded this where when I'm not here, others can hear it. That's why I do all this job. It's just, that's for the Lord. Last, they should not see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn again and I should heal them. Number 16, blessed are your eyes. Happy are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Now, I can teach you all the truths of the world. My teachers used to tell me, if you don't understand it today, stick it under your hat. Thirty years from now, you'll probably understand it. And I did. And I'm still understanding and I'm still learning every day what they taught me so long ago. We can think every now and then. I'll, I'll learn something just like that. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see. And did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Verse number 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. <clears throat> when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, the word of the kingdom. You know that God's churches are administrators of that kingdom here today. The kingdom didn't get postponed. It didn't get put away. The kingdom of God is, is in God's churches. He is reigning in his churches today. The word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one. Who does this? Who takes it out of your heart? The evil one. Who is the evil one? Satan and his emissaries. And snatches it away, which has been sown in his heart. And this is the one whom the seed was sown beside the road. It starts. Jesus starts explaining this parable to you. And the one whose seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Those guys that get real happy about studying the Bible, but they never get God in their hearts. <coughs> They'll get happy, excited, but there is no root in Christ. Pretty soon, they're going to go away. Verse number 21. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. That's because he never knew Christ. He was just religious. Religion will do one or two things for you. Religion, the word religion means the act of binding back again. It either binds you to God or binds you away from him in false religion. And the devil's got more false religion out there than the Lord's got truth. I said here many times, Brother Ben M. Borgard used to say, a lie could get a hundred miles before the truth could get his boots on. And I'll tell you what, religiously in the world that's going on. And the one on whom seed was uh, sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worries of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. 
It's re easier for a rich man, uh, I mean for a camel to go through the eye of a surgical needle than a rich man to get into heaven because so many times greed will keep you out of heaven. 23. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good ground, this is the man who hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold. But I'm going to tell you something. In John, it also talks about you've got to be connected to the vine. You've got to have root in the Lord. Okay? Some uh, fruit, a uh, hundredfold, sixty and some thirty. And number twenty-four. And he presented another parable saying the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, while mankind were sleeping, the enemy, who's the enemy? Satan. Satan went out and he sowed bastard wheat. That's what it literally says. Bastard wheat. Illegitimate wheat. It's false wheat. Fake wheat. Fake churches, so to speak. A false religion among the wheat, and he went away. And once the devil sows the wheat, I mean the, the false wheat among the real wheat, he don't have to work with it anymore. Mankind's real good about working his own way, way to heaven. I want to tell you something about Islam for just a moment. Islam is the most rational religion you can possibly think of. Really. You know, there's about 85,000 people a day becoming Muslims. You know why? Muslims say that no man is responsible for Adam's sin. You are responsible for your own sins all your life. Nobody can redeem you. You have to be a good man yourself. If you do anything horrible, then you've got to shed your own blood to pay for it. Now, the Mormons basically believe that same way. Redemption is by self. Almost every false religion, how do you get to heaven? Jesus pays part of the payment, but how do you get to heaven? you got to get yourself there. God says, I did it. It is done deep. You believe in me because I carried the cross. I went to the garden. I sweat great blobs of blood. I had the nails driven through my hands. I had old Goliath's sword stuck in my side. And I gave up my spirit for you. You don't pay anything. It's by grace. For in grace, Ephesians 2 and 8. For in grace you are having been saved through faith. And the faith didn't come from you either. That's a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should brag about it. There's nothing you can do to get to heaven, people. Jesus paved the way and going to carry you there. He's going to carry you there. If you get to heaven, it'll be on Jesus' back. It's not going to be anything you're going to do. It's going to be the Lord. He presented another parable saying, The kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, and all his terrors come up. Verse number 26. But when the sweet sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident. All right? How do you tell that they're evident? You go out and check them out. How do you tell there's false religion in the world? Go listen to them. You listen to them a little bit and you'll figure it out. What are they going to do with Jesus? First of all, they're going to do away with him. That's not the only way of salvation. Or else he paid part of the price. He just, well, like Catholicism and everything else... You are baptized for the remission of sins for your Adamic nature, then you're responsible for the rest of it. Then you've got to pay for it, you've got to get yourself your good work deeds, you've got to outweigh your bad deeds. Now that's human, isn't it? Isn't that rational? Now, it's irrational, but this is God's mind. God said, I'll pay for it. It's done. How much did it cost God? Everything. We're going to find that out. <laughs> and the slaves of the landlord came and said to him, Sir, Master, Lord, do you know, didn't you sow a good seed in your field? And how then does it, where did these tares come from? And he said to them, An enemy. It, it's actually not an enemy because there's no indefinite articles in Greek. It is the enemy. The enemy. 
You just forget it. If, it, if, it's not a, if it's an A there or an N there, forget it. It's either V or nothing. Okay? The enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, Do you want us then to go out and gather them up? This is false religion. He must have been, Jesus must have been a Baptist because he said, Let's let him go. And he said, No, lest uh, when you're gathering up the tares, you might root up the wheat with them. You might, you might damage the wheat. That's the truth. The truth is going to have enough trouble as it is. Don't go out there and step on them and damage them in the meanwhile. Allow them to grow together until the harvest. In the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up and gather the wheat into my barn. All right. You know what's going to gather false religion together in the end? It's going to be a one ecumenical world movement. That's what's going to happen. I don't know what it is, but there's going to be some type of lying wonders in the skies that people are going to, they're going to believe that uh, they're going to believe that the Messiah that is here is the real Messiah. And they're going to believe that uh, Mohammed and Jesus and all of them were prophets. All point either one way. And there's a great big wide road to heaven. And you just go your own way. Then he presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard tree seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is a, a, one of the smaller of all the seeds. But when it's fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. Now, I'm going to tell you something. A mustard is a mustard. But this one here is a monstrosity. This is something different. So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Who were the birds? Who were the birds before this? The devils. Now, this great monstrosity, this great big religious movement, and the culmination of it is going to be in the tribulation period when it's going to take over the world and true religion will be gone. There will be some true people, individuals, believing and dying on this earth, but the churches are going to be gone. There are going to be people saved during that time. It's going to be like on the outside of Noah's Ark, scratching and crawling and dying and, and believing. But they waited too late. Don't wait till after the rapture to believe. It's too dangerous to believe before the rapture, <laughs> before the flood, before the judgment comes. Smaller than all the other seeds in the garden plants become the tree, and the dirty birds that ate up the seed go and nest in the branches. And he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took. Most of the time when he talks about a woman in the Bible, what's it talking about? Evil. 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 What is a woman of Revelation? The great harlot of Revelation. This is who it's talking about. That woman. That woman has worked her way through time in false religion. All the way down. And she'll be in full power and full bloom during the tribulation period. Took and hid three pecks of meal, took three measures until it was all leavened. It, when it's completely leavened, that's in the tribulation period. That's false religion, people. There is no true religion then. Only believers. Number 34. All these things uh, Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables, and he was not talking to them without a parable, so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, All my mouth in parables, and I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. And he left the multitudes, the great many, and went into the house. And his disciples came and said, Explain to us a parable of the tares in the field. And he answered and said, The one who sows the good seed is who? The, man. the son of man. Who is that? Yeah. How, about, how about Daniel 7? That's who it's talking about, Daniel 7. Remember when we studied about the, the four uh, flags of Israel? The son of man. The son of man was God. And who was in the, who was in the lion's den? And who was in the fiery furnace? One like unto the Son of Man, one of the gods is among us. This is a this is a unbeliever, a pagan saying this, but he said one of the gods is in there. 
All right? It looks like a man because God would become flesh. And the field is the world, and the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy sold them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall be at the end of the age. And the Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. The word lawlessness uh, is anomia. Every lost man is under the law. It is condemned. When you are born again, then you are no longer lawless. You're lawless in Satan, man, because you're not under the law. But you're an outlaw if you don't believe in the Lord. Verse 42. And I will cast them in the furnace of fire. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous shall shine forth in the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. This is very important. This is the, this is the part you're going to understand now. This is the part when you ask me about the man Jesus in the garden. What did it cost God to buy your salvation? Everything. He paid it all. He become like you. What does Emmanuel mean? God works. Okay. And the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and uh, from joy over them goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Sells all that he has and buys. He sells out. So many people in the past, so many false religions, they talk about this is when you're really saved, you just sell out and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This did not have anything to do with salvation on our part. This is what the Lord did. This is the Lord. This is His cost. And you know who this treasure represents? Brother John, do you remember who that represents? Mm -hmm. Israel. What did it cost God to call out Israel in all reality. Everything. Everything. <coughs> 45. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like on the merchant seeking uh, fine pearls. Now, here we go. This is us. And upon finding one pearl of great value, what did he do? What did the Lord do? He went and sold everything he had this isn't you buying salvation. This isn't you. This is God buying you. It cost him everything. It says that he he didn't look upon deity as something to be held on to when he was in the flesh. That flesh of Jesus was like the second Adam. In that flesh dwelt deity. But that flesh is related to you. Just like you feel. Who's going to be every man's judge? Jesus. You know why? Because he is a judge of us. He's one of us. He knows. And you're not going to say anything. No excuse to Jesus that he didn't feel. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragon that cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And it was filled up. They, they uh, threw it up on the beach. And they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they, they threw away. Boy, when you think about so many lives that are spent in false religion and what it costs them. If you're a Herbert Armstrong group, it's going to cost you a triple time. Three times more than what it costs God's to. Of course, God's people never give anything unless they give beyond the tithe. <laughs> because the tithe is the Lord's. But Armstrong asked for a triple tithe. Your Mormons, they ask for more. You tithe for this, you tithe for that, you tithe for this, you tithe for that. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels come forth and take out of the wicked from among the righteous and to cast them into the furnace of fire and they shall be weak and not be teeth. Number 51, have you understood all these things? They said to him, and they said, nay. That's nay. That means yes. And he said, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom, a habitual learner, mathetes, to basileu, of the 
kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household that brings forth out of his treasure things new and things old. It came about when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. Coming into his hometown, he began, actually what it says in Greek, it's kept on teaching them in the synagogue. His hometown. The very, where was that? Nazareth is the Hebrew term. Nazareth. Nazareth means root. Do you know that there was a rabbi school there? In Nazareth. There was a rabbinical school in Nazareth. And Jesus was a rabbi. Did you know that? You know he was a rabbi. rabbi yeah. Uh huh. You know what a rabbi is? Teacher. Yeah. No. Well, he's teacher, all right. That's one of the things he is. You know what a rabbi is? Doctor. The word what? Doctor. Doctor of theology. When you when you when they considered you as a doctor, then you were called doctor, and that word doctor was rabbi. Okay. You know the high term. He was a rabbi. Oh, when he was 12 years old in the temple, brother, he was a rabbi. He was confounding them. And they said, when he kept on teaching them in the synagogue, so they became struck out of their senses, is what it literally said, and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miracle, miraculous powers when these great powers is this not the stone mason's son? Is this not mother called Mary? And his mother called James and Joseph and, and Simon and Judas? And his sisters are they all, all with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. The first time he got up and spoke, as was his custom, he went to that synagogue all the time. But when he got up and he read to them that scroll that time, and he said, this day these things are fulfilled in your hearing. What did they want to do to Jesus then? Kill him. For what? For what? Why was Jesus crucified? Why did Israel... Why was Jesus crucified? Because he said he, said he was God. That's why he said he was God and they crucified because they crucified him for blasphemy. He said, are you the God the Son or the Son of Man? He said, yes. And not only that, well, this, go to Daniel 7 and verse 13, I think it is. Daniel 7 and 13. <clears throat> 7, 13 and 14. Book of Daniel. <coughs> Well, somebody's out there bound to have Daniel 7, 30. Have you got that, Brother David? I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His well, dominion is an everlasting dominion. He is the everlasting reigner. He is the Son of Man. He is the, This is who Jesus said He was. Now, Acts, the first chapter, they said that this is the Son of Man. This is the Son of Man. As you see Him go away, He's going to come back again. Jesus said before Caiaphas, what did He tell the Caiaphas? He quoted Daniel 7, 13, and 14. And they said, You are a blasphemy. You are saying, You're God. What more do we need? Here He is. Well, they didn't believe him. And then it says, uh, and his sisters, in verse 57, they took offense at him. Actually, it says they became, he became a stumbling block to them. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and his own household. I guarantee you, you might be the greatest preacher in the world, but when you go home, you're just another guy. <laughs> I 
I, I heard that they didn't want to believe him because they didn't want to lose their power. Well, that's so right. Did they believe him a little? Or? Some believed, some didn't. The majority of these did not believe. Caiaphas, what he, he prophesied that year, and he said it is not necessary for one to die for the whole nation and everything will bring it in peace. Uh, he wanted to kill Jesus, but it was prophecy also. It was, that was kind of a dual thing. He, he prophesied also. He prophesied that. He wanted to kill him. He said, he will take our nation away from us and our religion away from us. They said, we're not going to give up their religion or their nation and our kingdom away from us. Did Jesus take their kingdom away from them? He sure did. Yeah. When he walked into the into the temple area and he turned over the the, the benches there, he was he was he was doing something that had been going on in pagan religion all over there. The priests were the money changers and they were the bankers and they had a bench out there. And every false religion had a money changer, had a banker in it. And the priest, the high priest, usually was the banker. And if 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 he became dishonest, he was to be publicly whipped and and uh, capital punishment. Later on, they crucified. They took his bench and broke it publicly. That's where we get the word bank, bankrupt. That's where it came from. Bankrupt was broken bench. That's what it really means. They would break that bench, and they would and they would say that they, that, that you are bankrupt. That what you're doing is wrong. You are an embezzler and a liar. Now Jesus, when he went in there, who was over all of the money changers? The high priest. The high priest. What did Jesus say to the high priest when he whooped all the servants and he broke the benches? You are bankrupt. <coughs> you are bankrupt. Your religion is bankrupt. I take it away from you. I take my kingdom. Because it was his kingdom. Who was supposed to be on the throne anyway? What's supposed to be that Idumean Esauite? It's supposed to be Joseph. And when he died, Jesus was supposed to be on the throne. I gave you the double lineages the other day. Remember when we looked at the lineage of Luke and we looked at the lineage of Matthew? Matthew was the lineage of the king. That was Joseph's lineage. The Luke... Luke is the scientist. He's the doctor. He's the one that's going to tell you that Jesus really lived in real flesh and bones. He was a human being. That he was God in flesh. But he was the son of man. All right, and he really died on the cross of Calvary. And he really res he was resuscitated. He stood again. He stood again. That's what Luke tells you. And that's the lineage of Mary. That's the seed of the woman. Isn't this beautiful? You know, when you believe the truth, you don't have any blank walls. You would have so many blank walls when you don't believe the truth. But when you believe the truth, all the stories and all the little threads tie together. This carpet right here has got a lot of threads in it. The Word of God is like that carpet. Every one of those threads go to some fastened part. Every little particle of truth in the Word of God ties into one thing, the person of God. God is revealing himself to us. What is the last book in the Bible? Revelation. All right. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. A Christu. The revelation of Jesus Christ. What it does, it shows you God. And he's going to win too. <laughs> he's going to win. Go on a little further. And he did, and they did, he did not do many miracles there because of their what? Unbelief. God gives you a dangerous gift. He gives you volition. In eternity past, God knew everyone that was going to be saved. He knew everyone was going to be saved. He knew everyone was going to be in a false religious system. He knew whether they would come out of it or not come out of it. He knew everyone that was going to be with him in the end time. But the promise that he made and the edict that he laid in eternity past that he would come and he would die and he would redeem man, mankind back. He knew that the angels and the spirits would rebel against him. He's not going to redeem them. 
Well, they rebelled. They're done. He knew that mankind, that he was going to breathe into Adam, the breathing is a lie. And God would breathe that life into him. And he'd bring a, a forth a human race. And he also knew that Adam would sin. But he knew how he would redeem that sinful race because this is the only creature that was created in the image of God. Right? The thorough triune image of God. Angels are not triune. There are three groups of them we know about. Gabriel, Michael, and Daniel. Or, uh, Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. We know that there are three groups of them. There are three heavens, basically. We talk about the triuneness of the creation. But man is created in his image, in his spiritual image. Once you've been born again, you have the spirit of redemption in you. You are marked. Your DNA is forever indelibly marked to be redeemed and, and, and resurrected. Your soul that lives in there, that's where you do all your thinking. That's going to be redeemed. And the body, even though there is no provision for it right now, there is going to be a provision for the material. You're going to be resurrected and you're going to be changed if you're born again. If you're born again. Do you have any questions? Does this book mean more to you now? These, do these parables mean more to you? When you, I know some of you, when you read this book to begin with, they said, man, that book, I don't understand a thing in that book. Remember when some of you said that? I don't understand anything here. There is a time element in learning. A time element in learning. Now, do you have any questions? No questions? Rex, Connor, girls, Brother John? Yes, girls. Yes, all right. Okay, I want to go back to uh, Matthew 14, 47. No, uh, Matthew uh, 14, uh, 49. 14, 49. No, 50. <laughs> I'll get there. Must have been 13. Matthew? Matthew 14. 14, 13. Uh, 13? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm in 13. Yeah. yeah okay. You get me in 15. Yeah. Okay, 13, 15. Yeah. Okay. Where is the uh, fiery furnace? The fiery furnace? Mm -hmm. And what it. is the fiery furnace? The fiery furnace is going to be the lake of fire. The lake of fire doesn't really exist yet as far as for the, the, the Sheol and Hades exist today. <laughs> the Sheol and Hades will be resurrected and thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire or hellfire does not really exist. I mean, it, it, the first people is going to be in hellfire. You know who that is? <laughs> the devil and the false prophet. Okay? Mm -hmm. The false prophet and antichrist, that is, uh, are going to be in the lake of fire. But the lake of fire, that place, that it talked about separating the sheep and the goat nations and everything here, what they do, everything, all of what happens over here at the end of this period of time. See, there's going to be, uh, God is going to reign through Israel on this earth for 1,000 years. 1,000 years. You know that a woman that's capable, girls, you're capable of having 1,000 children. You know that? You're capable of having 1,000 children. And during that period of time, the earth will re be repopulated. There will be only one-sixth of the Gentiles, and that means everybody besides the Jews, there's going to be one-sixth of the world population left. But they're going to go into that millennial reign in their bodies. Now, this is going to be a theocracy there. All right? Uh, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the... Gardner, Ted Armstrong, and all of them, they, they, have their, they want to have their theocratic kingdom, but that theocratic kingdom isn't going to take place yet. But when that theocratic kingdom takes place, men are going to live together. They're going to, they're going to be forced to live together righteously. The animals are not going to hurt each other. They're going to be just like they were before the flood. They're going to live together. Nobody's going to kill anybody. Nobody's going to eat anybody. Everybody's going to get along. 
all of the creation is going to be like the Garden of Eden on this earth. And Israel, the national Israel, is going to be over all of that. They're all going to go in and when they have their feasts and their religious ceremonies, all of them are going to understand what all of those release, those feasts and religious ceremonies stood for. They all stood for one thing, that God would become flesh and He would redeem His people. That God wanted to dwell with His people. The whole tabernacle, I mean, I could take 20 weeks and teach on that tabernacle, everything in that tabernacle, and you would see God the Son in it. All of the boards around here that stood in his presence all stood on silver sockets. What does silver stand for in the Bible? Redemption. Redemption. What does gold stand for in the Bible? Deity. Deity. And all the boards are wood. What does wood stand for? Humanity. Humanity. Here we have all of these standing around, the glory of God, and then that box where the glory of God stands. That box is made out of wood. But it is covered with solid gold, which is deity, so we know that God was flesh. John 1.14 says, Kaiholo go starts again ago, and the word, or the Jehovah, or the Adonai, and we talked the other night uh, about the Aramaic, the word, well, see, that was last Wednesday, wasn't it? That I, <coughs> no, that was Wednesday night. Yeah, Wednesday night I talked about the Word of God. The Word. Every time it said, and God walked with Adam in the garden, actually in the Aramaic Bible it says, and the Word walked with Adam in the garden. The Word. And the Word was Jehovah. Every time. And every place where they have the name Jehovah, they have the, the name Word there. And of course John, that was the authorized version <coughs> of their translation that was used in every synagogue, and they knew who the Word was. So when John wrote about the Word of God, they knew this was Jehovah. In the beginning, kept on being Jehovah. Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead because he kept on being God. All right? And then it says, And the Word, and the Jehovah flesh he became, and pitched his tent among the tabernacle. And the tabernacle itself, every one of these blankets here, stood for something about the person of God. And the two angels that stood over the mercy seat. And the mercy seat in, in, in Hebrew is kafar, and in Greek it is holosmos. It means covering, atonement. Jesus is our atonement. And he was the mercy seat. And we have two angels standing over there, over the mercy seat, to, to be witnesses of the atonements or the forgiveness of sins. And that's why I told you, everybody that's saved when you're saved, there is at least two angels there to witness your salvation because the atonement was made. That's what that mercy seat, that's what that ark of the covenant stood for there. Are you ready to go and do something out in the world? Are you ready to go out and do something? Or are you... Ready, ready, ready to go get a massage. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and enduring those hard seats. I know how hard they are. No, I've been moving furniture all day. That's what's wrong with me. Oh. <laughs> I can feel every Muslim, everybody's starting to tighten up now. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine does the same thing. Did you, uh, Connie, did you get one of these? Yeah. yeah. Did you get one of those? That's on yeah. the four flags right. of Israel typifying the four Gospels. There were... That you get right there, didn't you? Yeah. They, those four Gospels all represented God in a certain fashion. And it is beautiful. The Word of God is so beautiful. It's revealing God to us. Revealing God to us. Well, I hope that you've studied this. We'll come back next week and we'll do it some more. We're going to just open another door and you'll just keep walking. Walking in. I want to bring you a little bit of information on the tabernacle and show you a little bit more about that. As we see this, God is revealing Himself to us. The mysteries, the secrets, hidden from eternity past in all the, of the ordinances and everything that they had that revealed God to us. All right. Let's go out there. Are, are you satisfied for tonight? I don't want to turn you loose. Half done. Brother David, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, brother? Lord Jeremy, Father, thank you so much for this evening and what we have learned and been exposed to. And 
help us to take it within our hearts and, and digest it and, and understand it and be able to relate it to those who have not heard. Be with us this week as we go about our business and, and bless us in our <coughs> yes, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. As you go out there, there's a, a turquoise Packard out there. I call it Anastasia. <laughs> <laughs> the resurrection. That car was abandoned for 38 years on the side of the canal tank. Yeah. Yeah. Out there in Pumpkin Center. Yeah. 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 Out in Pumpkin Center. I got it and an Anastasia. <laughs> 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 it's resurrection. Huh? Huh? 38 to go straight A, huh? Yeah. It's a uh, 327 straight A. Yeah. Okay, I didn't want to take everybody's time, but I need to ask a question. Okay, let me let me tell you where I'm at, and you tell me where I am. Okay, let me go turn this thing off, okay. and I'll be right back to you. I don't want you to go off of here, out of here.